Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Hopefully, this is the uh, first show in like three episodes where we start off with everyone's audio working <laughs> to start off. That would be that would be pretty damn nice. Um, so let me just uh, check that we are all good to go. Um, let's have a look. Are we are we good? Do you know if we can uh, hear people? Oh. I think ah, you're muted on Zoom. There we go. So, okay, uh, now we're now we're perfect. Now we're we perfect. Go. So we've already had some technical <laughs> debugging to start the show. This is like a multi-purpose show. You come on, and you're like, hey, I want to know how to sort audio problems in Zoom <laughs> yeah. and OBS, and I'm like, well, you come to the right place. This isn't a movie channel. This is just like 101 problems of Zoom and live yes, streaming. Exactly. We're using people like Fabian um, just to get some extra audio <laughs> yeah. problems. Um, that's hot. Yeah, I mean, are we good? Are we good? Are we uh, all coming through? I think so. I'll do a quick check. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. I can hear. Yeah, you. we're perfect. Okay. Yeah, we're Brilliant. perfect. Okay. So, hello, everyone, yes. and welcome to episode <laughs> six of the Movie Buffs, where every episode will begin with a uh, a quick technical uh, rundown to make sure everything's working. We don't do this stuff before the show. We're not organized. We uh, no. Well, we nearly had chaos before we started in the the, uh, the audio. Uh, no, not the audio. My Wi-Fi just like completely died about five minutes before we planned on starting. So it was like panic stations yeah. of the highest order. We know there are millions out there watching who uh, rely on this on this show. So we've got to get really good, you know? Yeah. Well, I was I was like, I got 50 minutes to the show, so I got loads of time. And then I looked down and I looked back at the clock and I was like, <laughs> two minutes? Two minutes? What? How did that time go by so fast? Oh, well, you I know, mean, it's just, so... you know... Time flies when you're having fun, and you're evidently having a lot of fun yeah. waiting to 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 kick the show off. You know. Yeah, we already got a love heart in, in the chat, which is always nice to start oh, off a stream. Go. Meg, Give wonder Meg, love. appreciation. Right back at you, Meg. There you go. So this is uh, already a brilliant. I think we could just end the show right there, if I'm honest. It's perfect. We've had a hundred percent positivity, as opposed to uh, some other streams where uh, maybe things have been a little bit uh, of a roller coaster ride. I'm not talking about the uh, initial Fabian stream. I'm talking about last episode where I got uh, a, a shitload of abuse for my uh, my claims about Star Wars. Oh, Star Wars. Yeah, well, we're going to have to do a special edition show for Star Wars because, you know, there's lots of opinions out there and uh, those people uh, need to be heard, I suppose, or they need to, to, to hear us out and then abuse us through the chat <laughs> like last time. <laughs> I mean, hey, I think we've got a bit of a, you know, some nice diversity on our Star Wars viewpoints, but I don't know. I think I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a niche person, but we'll we'll save that for sure for a, uh, a, a yeah. future episode because when we're uh, eventually out of content, we need to just start running through franchises and having the most, sharing the most controversial opinions that we can possibly offer on the whole thing. I think Lord of the Rings should have been one movie <laughs> and then just watch like, <laughs> the chat just explode. <laughs> Yeah, I don't genuinely. Uh, we'll get to that, that eventually. Just to, that one, just to put that out there, we'll get to that eventually. So, I think one of the first things uh, I just want to mention because I'm sure people will tune into the stream and think, "Oh, I finally watched one of those episodes," and then they go, "Oh, this is pretty shit. I'm gonna leave." Um, so get some of the yeah. cool stuff out of the way. Um, we potentially have an announcement. You were telling me this earlier. Um, I didn't. I, I didn't really know anything about this, and then I saw the event, I'll say. I'm just trying to uh, give you as many hints as I can so you know what I'm talking about, so you can uh, <laughs> you can tell people what I'm on. Yeah, I'll just get the poster up now just to be 100% sure. But yeah, so basically on the 20th of December, uh, there is uh, like loads of live streams happening uh, for the Autumn Tribute Fund, so to raise money for Autumn Snyder, Zack Snyder's daughter, who passed away in uh, 2017, so is the dick. The Hall of Justice, Justice, I should say. And there's like a, an American, all the Americans have their own streams, of course. They'll have a, a set time and that's already up online. Uh, loads of people have already shared it. But there's also going to be an international stream. So us guys from Ireland and England and I think around Spain maybe as well, different places like that, around Europe, we're going to be having a, a stream on also trying to raise funds for, for the Autumn Fund, which is just past 30,000 right now, which is yeah. pretty great. Uh, the goal is 50,000, but then I think a lot of the dark side shirts were selling pretty well. And then, of mm -hmm. course, AFSP uh, and a whole uh, is, is pretty good. But yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Hopefully, we'll have a guest by that time as well, a, a pretty special guest. We're, we're working on something like that. 
but I'm looking forward to it. And it's just, we'll, we'll have a stream. I suppose we'll talk a lot about, about a lot of movie stuff, but of course, encourage people to donate and we'll have the link in the description. So I'm looking forward to that big time. Hell yeah. And this was just something that I saw it uh, originally posted on Twitter and I was like, like, whoa, that's that's like a fucking awesome thing to do. And I know the community's kind yeah. of done a few of these in the past where you have these kind of like super long blocks of time um, and like 20 different people are streaming um, and you just kind of go from the one to the next one to the next. And if you're busy that day, you just tune into what you can. Um, but to be asked to do it and this is the this is the awkward part because th if there's a realization that that was a mistake and we're just here talking for 10 minutes like hell yeah man we're gonna fucking rock this international panel it's gonna be yeah. awesome man <laughs> oh who, who tells them it's all right if, if yeah. we're not a part of it we will do our own 12-hour stream just us <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we'll, we'll help raise money but no it's supposed to be good it's supposed to be good fun like we're gonna have the four, four nerds to be there of course the uh, light cast Film Junkie and Chris Wan are having a stream, Real Emotion, we've also got Points Dexter Lounge, uh, Women of the Watchtower, uh, Den of Nerds, World's Finest. So there's so many people who have been a part of the Snyder Cut community over the last few years and people who have come over the last few years as well into it and they're going to have their streams and I'm sure it's going to be a good day's entertainment all around of good fun discussion. And yeah, we're gonna have as much fun as we can. We might have some, we might we might organize something fun for that day. Uh, maybe some games maybe. or something like that. Maybe. Yeah, something. We'll, we'll organize something that's pretty fun. It is uh, just one of those things to kind of reflect on when you think back to. I know I always keep bringing it back to this, but you know, you sit in there typing out that hashtag for the first time, and then here we are. We're like, oh, we're one of the very you know cool few people. Of course, everyone's cool in this community, but we're one of the select group who've managed to you know be asked to be a part of this um, of this project that's helping us get to half a million dollars that's helping us tip yeah. us over the edge a half a million yeah. dollars raised over the course of several years which is just like <laughs> insane it's brilliant and even uh, wonder meg is in the chat she's organized so many things as well and yes. done so much great work exactly. so like that's just that's just one of, of 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 many people who've put in so much serious work and it's it's uh, i'm i'm proud to know these people and to be friends with them online and hopefully someday we get to meet in some capacity all these people yes. but it's pretty cool to to know positive people who want to do good work and yeah, let it make it, let it continue, as they say. That would be pretty awesome if we got to do a. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there'll be some kind of like in-person screening of the Snyder Cut when. Oh, sorry. When uh, when uh, you know we're all, COVID's kind of calmed down a little bit. Um, but you know, to think of all those people coming together in one place, like we had with the Art Center event and uh, uh, and other things, just coming together. Yeah. Just just to come all yeah. together for the Snyder Cut. That's fucking awesome, man. And it's cool because like there's so many people in the Snyder Cut community and we all have different talents and unique skills. Yeah. Like some people are cool at making posters. Some people are cool at making GIFs or graphics or, or trail, a fan-made trailer. Some people are really good at organizing stuff. So it's good that we can all work together and use our skills to have a, a better goal and a common goal in mind. So I think it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't have said it better myself. So look out for uh, December 20th for that event. I believe that's a Sunday. Um, so... Uh, if you can't find it, just uh, I think the easiest way you can go on Twitter and search for uh, Deck the Halls of Justice or Autumn Snyder. It'd be one of the first things that comes up. Um, and yeah, that'd be cool. And uh, if we yeah. haven't been invited, this will be the last episode of the Movie Buffs. And we'll get yeah, we're going to be protest. cancelled. Cancelled. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to be cancelled. So yeah, um, we'll we'll move on. Um, I think one of the, the one of the the cool things that's come out as of late is the uh the buzz surrounding wonder woman 1984 um in the i think it's kind of like the press junket or whatever so these are the kind of people who kind of get asked if or get shown the film early um so whether there is an ex whether there is an amount of bias in that group like are these the people who are trying to stay on the studio's good side so that they get to see films early yeah entirely possible but that doesn't undermine the that doesn't you know uh undermine the fact that the reviews have been glowing for wonder woman 1984 which uh you know as i make you feel yeah it's pretty good like it's the official embargo is until the 15th of december so that's when yeah. you can make videos and on youtube or write articles with a, a full in-depth review but uh yeah it's it's good it, it shows confidence from warner brothers that they're happy enough with the movie if they're willing to show it to critics uh, nearly a month early and for them to be allowed to use their social media platforms to talk about it. so that's pretty cool yeah, of course, they're going to be, they might be a little bit biased. They're not going to come out and say, I hate this movie. This, <laughs> this, this is terrible, of course. But it is a good sign on, on Warner Brothers' part that they did think it was good enough to be seen this early. And the good thing is, it's 
I just seen trailers last night on TV here that it's going to be released on the 16th of December, uh, as we knew. But to, to see it officially being marketed is brilliant. Yeah. So we're we're going to get to see it nine days early before the US, which is going to be cool. And I think out of all them cool streams that I mentioned, and they're really cool guys. Well, I think we're going to have a special Wonder Woman stream before all of them because yeah. we'll we'll have seen the movie and we, we get to talk about it. Yeah. But um, wow. the good reviews. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the reviews are great. So I, I'm looking forward to the movie. I think it's it, the trailers, the TV spots, even the one that came out yesterday, just looks like a beautiful looking film. Mm. And I, I just like I was watching the TV spot they put last night. It was like a minute long from Brazil Comic Con, and it's it just felt inspiring. I don't know. It just it just feels like it's going to be an inspiring film. So I, I can't wait. But do these reviews do anything for your hype, or do you really listen to reviews at all? I mean, I'm always one of those people who. Uh... I'm kind of curious for reviews. I, I, I look into them and just see, like, oh, what are people saying? But at no point do they ever dictate whether I watch a film or not. I'm just interested in seeing, you know, wh- what's the early reaction, you know? Um, yeah. Like, when it comes to things like Rotten Tomatoes or whatever, I will pretty much every film that comes out that I might be interested in seeing, I will have a, you know, a cursory glance at, at, at the scores. Um, but obviously the audience score is much more important uh, than the critic score. But... Yeah, it's just one of those things I, I I check out. So with Wonder Woman, I mean, I, I never really kind of doubted Patty Jenkins. I thought that the first Wonder Woman movie, the more I thought, I remember coming out of seeing Wonder Woman, I was like, that was really fun, cool. And then when I was in the car driving home, the, the longer I was in the car, the more I just kept thinking, Jesus, that movie was fucking awesome. And like, it just kept getting better in my head and, that, and better and better. Um, So yeah, I mean, I, I never really doubted um Patty Jenkins. I, I'm... I love the 80s vibe of the whole thing anyway. So, I mean, I was kind of sold as soon as we heard that it was going to be set in the 80s. Um, and then things just kind of kept getting better from there. So, yeah, the, the, the critics don't really alter my hype for the movie uh, in any sense. But yeah. they definitely just kind of maybe add like a little sprinkle of, okay, this could be this could be pretty fucking cool. And, uh, yeah, uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, but the, you brought up an interesting point about like uh, fans... Uh, score of the movie the, the that's more important than the critic review i think kind of rotten tomatoes is losing its kind of hype or influence that it had maybe the last few years because mm-hmm. look we can't we don't have box office to compare so you can't say one wonder woman or Zack snyder's just league doesn't compare to the mcu movies or you mm-hmm. can't compare it to the dark knight trilogy uh, money wise all you have to do is take it at face value and talk about the movie and i think that's pretty interesting and pretty unique because i I can remember in the past movies that I love w- wouldn't do that well at the box office and then they'd be tarnished because of their box office um, yeah. intake instead of how good the movie actually was. And I think it's pretty cool. And I think Rotten Tomatoes, is lo- even though it's still there, it will still continue to be there. I think it's losing its kind of influence in these type of movies. I think social media has gotten kind of bigger in the last few years with, with movies and them coming out and people like showing their reviews, uh, what they think of a movie straight away online. So uh, yeah, I like to listen to other people, my mutuals on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. I, I like listening to what they have to say because they're people I follow because I like their opinions and stuff like that, you know, not some critic that I pops up in my timeline that I never heard before. Mm-hmm. So, but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it and I, I just can't wait at this stage, 16th of December, can't wait. Yes. I, I think it was, uh, there was an interview with Amy Adams all those years ago. I think it was just as BVS just kind of getting ripped a new one by critics. Um, the yeah. theatrical cut anyway and she just kind of came out and just said like why the hell do you care what these people have to say about your movie maybe that's just kind of the the de facto response that you kind of position that you take when your movie is getting negative reviews but just to say you know if you want to watch a movie go watch it you know <laughs> you, you don't need anybody else to tell you whether you should or shouldn't watch a movie um yeah, yeah i definitely agree i think i think just film critics in general um uh, you know not not just rotten tomatoes are kind of losing their their hold on a lot of things um i think you know with streaming services because of the convenience that they present it's just a case of you sitting there and maybe scrolling through the your film or movie options on whatever streaming service you're looking at and just saying do i want to watch that yeah why not it's not a case of, yeah. i can see the influence that a critic may, a critics may have in general because it's you know going to the cinemas it's it's an, an actual effort and it sounds like such a yeah western country first world problem but it's you know it's you have to get up you know maybe get changed yeah. get in your car you have to drive somewhere um or commute somewhere um you know buy your ticket get your ticket 
maybe go stand in line and then go and sit down and obviously for like people like us that's like one of the best things ever like <laughs> yeah i love that yeah. experience but streaming services yeah just in general i think completely um drastically reduce the amount of input that critics have in terms of determining whether people watch something or not um so i i mean personally i think that's a good thing i think if that's encouraging yeah. more people to be a bit more autonomous with the movies that they watch then you know that, that why why would that be a bad thing um yeah and interesting point like you get up and go to the cinema like there's movies this year that i have watched that i wouldn't go to the cinema to watch even though like a movie on netflix or a movie on disney plus or something like that i might click it and watch it because it looks interesting but if it came out on cinemas and it was being marketed i was like oh, i don't know if i go see that because I, don't, I don't want to spend my money on something that i'm not gonna really like you know for a comic book movie i save my money for that or star wars or marvel or dc because i want to actually go to those movies i want to see them opening night so i might save my money and then for a lower budget indie film i might be like oh i, I don't know if i want to see that but it's, yeah. it's kind of cool how on netflix and stuff and this year i've watched so many movies that i wouldn't usually watch because of the pandemic, because I can't go anywhere. It's only a click of a button, as you said. Yeah. But now that's even better for Zack Snyder's Just League and, and Wonder Woman being on HBO Max. Yeah. Because people will be like, oh, there's Wonder Woman's next adventure. The Snyder Cut, or whatever, Zack Snyder's Just League or Just League. They click it, all right, cool, I'll sit down and watch this. So, like, you know, even, that goes for all the other stuff that's coming as well from cinema. So, uh, I'm looking forward to it. And I think it's this HBO Max scenario, this kind of Warner Brothers uh, new... Uh, uh, changing the landscape per se is pretty interesting yeah for sure um I, I i think it would be very interesting to see um i mean there's not a whole lot that streaming services can do to um match the movie going experience and this is just something that i see um retrograde productions in the chat says going to the cinema is a social outing much like going to the park or to a restaurant etc yes it's a comfort that movies are at home but how much can we watch at home until we get fed up and you know that's a very valid point in it but it raises that question you know what can streaming services do to you know say hey you know yeah the movie going experience isn't something you know particularly viable at the moment but you know look at all this look at all this is it just purely the case of yeah. quantity of or like the variety of choice that they give you and the the ease of access that's enough to kind of make you go oh i don't really need to worry about anything else but it's not like you know, some poor bastard that HBO Max is going to come to your house and then start, like, giving you blackout curtains and shit like that, yeah. and, you know, serving <laughs> you food at a counter. But it is just one of those That kind of goes for everything, though, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it, I mean... That the... goes for everything. Like, we want to go eat... We want to go eat... We don't, eat, we don't want to eat at home every night. We want to go out, have some fun, or go to the mm -hmm. pub or something like that. It goes for absolutely everything. It's just the world we're living in right now. Yeah, and I think it's just, it's just a problem that's kind of drastically exacerbated by the fact that movies are such a big money business. There's, you, you know, it's... Yeah at the end of the day it's you have a whole new dynamic to compete with we've seen like execs at hbo max saying that Zack snyder's justice league to them is already a success haven't put anything out you know it's not international yet you know at the time that they said that that it was nowhere near release so it's kind of like it's a, the metrics that you're using to compare whether something is successful or not or whether you're going to do more of it is completely different um so yeah it's not like you can rent well, you, it's not like you can pay for a month subscription to watch Zack Snyder's Justice League, or whatever, six times, like you could do with a cinema ticket, you just have to kind of watch it and give it, you know, the views and 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 spread it as much as possible. So the whole yeah. dynamic is completely different. And I, I mean, we'll you know get on this in a sec when we talk about the uh, the HBO Max dynamic that we have to work with now. What from the Wonder Woman trailers that we've seen so far, like what's really standing out to you that's different from maybe the first one? Is there anything specific? Well, I mean, yeah, the, the, the tone and vibe in general is obviously um, completely different, but I don't think necessarily that the original Wonder Woman's tone perfectly works with the 80s. Like, I know you have that kind of um, Cold War dynamic, but you don't really have that in the trenches combat that you see in, in the original Wonder Woman. You're not going to see her go into these, like, you know, glossy glamorous parties you know being shot at by a hundred people um yeah, yeah and mortars dropping on her or anything but um yeah i mean again this is one of the main things that i i, I that really draws me to dc films is just how much creativity and how open everything is with directors doing their own things so to see patty kind of go 
yeah, fuck yeah, let's do the 80s and let's just get real weird with it, I think is um, definitely interesting. Uh, I think probably the cast, I think it has to be um, the most standout thing for me, you know, gotta love uh, Pedro uh, and Kristen uh, and, and obviously Gal and Chris and all that. Um, and we know how DC has a pretty damn good record with its villains, um, so... And I have complete faith that Pedro is going to deliver like a really badass performance. So I think that's probably the thing that's got me the most hype would be the cast. Seeing how, and the final thing would be seeing how, if at all, I mean, not if at all, it's definitely, it should probably definitely be the case. How Patty still respects that BVS ending of the idea that, you know, a gal saying that I walked away from mankind a hundred years ago. It made sense then because she's obviously talking about the end of World War One. But then she's back in the 80s, so, you know, what, what is the, uh, how exactly do you respect that? Or is it just going to be one of those things that they just go, I uh, will just kind of ignore the fact that she said that line in BVS? I don't know. That's just, that's a tiny, tiny thing. And it wouldn't particularly ruin my enjoyment of the movie. We know Zach has had a pretty, you know, he's, he's produced Wonder Woman 84. His, his company has, uh, you know, a production credit for it. So I don't see them being like, yeah, fuck you, Zach. We're going to do our, our own thing. But yeah, those three yeah. things. It's probably similar to how Aquaman was, how Shazam was, how Birds of Prey was. They told their own story mm -hmm. in kind of their own world while referencing stuff that had happened in other movies, not completely on the nose, but referencing them in subtle things like in Shazam, the kid was playing with Batman and Superman figures, the battle rhyme was in it. In yeah. Birds of Prey, they're, they're talking about Joker a lot. They even referenced Bruce Wayne, you know, so things like that. Uh, I think it'll probably it might it not it might not have as many because it's set in the past before all these movies, but I'm 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 sure there might be a, a small um, hint of how she will become the character she is in Batman v Superman, which mm -hmm. is, is a hint that is a connective tissue to Batman v Superman. But again, it's in its own decade and, and doing its own thing. So yeah, I'm looking forward to Pedro Pascal's performance as well. Um, I don't know what, why, but just like it really interesting vibes from him from the traders like this kind of showman uh he's kind of showing off for people he loves being on camera i wonder why he's like when he's not on camera mm -hmm. so yeah and then christian wig as i've said before on other streams or on this stream like i'm not when she got cast i was like oh okay uh, but i'm not i'm not like dying to see her in the role but i'm looking forward to seeing what she can do and i hope she can prove me wrong and be an unbelievable villain yeah. that'd be pretty cool uh, but gal just looks brilliant in the suit she looks brilliant as diana she just looks brilliant for a woman, they say, who can't act, she looks pretty good on screen and she has a really good screen presence. For sure, for sure. And that, that's one of the uh, the kind of, let's say the expression, kind of just like a hole in one cast, you know, it's just like, that, that is yeah. perfect. I, I can't really imagine anybody else taking it up and maybe that's just a hindsight thing. Like now that we've seen Gal, you can't really imagine anyone else. It may be somebody else, whatever. Uh, I think that she's just that ace in the hole. There you go. She's just... Yeah. Uh, now that I've seen her, I just can't imagine anyone else taking that role. No, and like she just has this star power about her now because, like, coming into Batman v Superman, she wasn't really that known. She was from the Fast and Furious movies, but now she's just like mega star who's starring in a Netflix film on par with Ryan Reynolds and The Rock, which is supposed to come out next year. Yeah, and then we're gonna have her back for Zack Snyder's Justice League, which is a, a big plus. And then also Jason Momoa, who's a billion dollar star now, is a big plus. Superman, big plus. Ben Affleck coming back. These are all big pluses for Zack Snyder's Justice League. Mm -hmm. For that to be a success in whatever way, it's gonna be released internationally. I don't know yet, but we'll get to that eventually. But I, I, I'm looking forward to it. we get to see it in, at the, on the 16th. I can't wait to watch it on the big screen. And uh, I just hope that um, I just hope everyone has a good time watching the movie because it's tough times, Christmas things like that so hopefully it's good yeah exactly and i think the general plan is obviously we're gonna just try and watch that movie as soon as fucking possible um for those of you guys who don't know uh it's obviously uh the international release plan is not just drop it on the 25th for everybody um countries are getting it earlier than others i think we're here in the uk like one of the first to get it um if not the first yeah um on the 16th i believe as you said so yeah we may have seen the film a good two weeks or so before um north america let's say so uh yeah. obviously the people who watch the show aren't all from north america but the majority of people may not have seen it when we have so we will probably do a spoiler breakdown um we may have um an episode that gives our review without going into spoilers um or it might just be the case that the first five minutes of that 
show we just give non-spoiler reviews and the rest of it is all spoilers but obviously we've got to talk about it it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great it's i mean it's what the biggest film dropping this year maybe you could argue yeah tenet as well but i think probably wonder Woman probably takes the mantle um so yeah obviously we've got to talk about it yeah we just have to be careful because it's so hard not everybody can go see it at the same time yes if we do talk uh, about know, it it will be giant spoiler labels everywhere we are if you end up yeah. watching a video i will say now that it's your fault if, if we accidentally spoil it <laughs> um because we will put spoiler we, we, tags we could, everywhere yeah. It's so hard to do a non-spoiler review. <laughs> yeah, we'll just going... give a rating out of ten, and that'll be it. That's all you. Yeah, need. that's it. Yeah, it was. It was. It was. That's yeah, all we the give. Angle of your thumb will dictate yeah. when you get yeah. your rating. Um, but yeah, exactly. so yeah, I'm hyped as hell for that. That's only like what? It's just over a week away. Like, I mean, that's kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. And it would be really fucking nice to go to the cinema again. Um, but our, uh, I should ask: Are cinemas open where you are right now? I believe so. Uh, I fucking hope so. Oh. I need to actually check the uh, rules because where I am, we were in. I think we were in one of the. We were in like a. I can't remember which way around the tiers are, but we were in one of the. We were in probably the better tier, I think, and then we got moved into tier two. Um, oh, so yeah. it got worse. Literally, just like right as we came into the into the tier system. Um, but uh, the ones around here aren't. They aren't open yet, but I'm sure they were open for the 16th. But then they might not all open, so I might have to travel a bit to go see it. So I don't know yet. You see either. I'm hoping I can see it in the 16th. <laughs> oh yeah, that would be uh, that would be pretty rough. Let me just yeah. have a quick check because this will completely change. High level alert, level alert. All right, <laughs> that doesn't make yeah, any sense. Yeah, doesn't sound too good. <laughs> um, let's have a look. But the thing is about it, like, it just depends. Like, COVID could be really bad in a week from now, and then everything could, could be shut down again. You, you just don't know. So it could be really, really bad. Oh, there you go. And we are we are we are joined by a, uh, a very special guest, uh, Sean. I'll leave that to you because I need to try and work out if cinemas are going to be open. <laughs> I'm really concerned that they're not going to be open. do is just wait and find out what happens and um you know just time can tell to see what happens um but it, it, you yeah. know it, it, the entertainment business is screwed up here and it's just unbelievable yeah it is pretty like i remember i used to live in new york for uh four months five months and I, like i always remember the bars used to be packed every single night you know people used to be in there watching all the games nfl or uh, nhl and stuff like that and just packed out but it, it's a mad change now where you just you, you can't really go anywhere and people are just stuck at home and they're going mad and as you said the entertainment business is kind of in a, in a, in a bad situation now but man I, I, I look i've been i following the twitter page zombie with a gun or, or the shotgun i should say for a very long time and uh i just kept popping up my timeline and stuff i want to start with you you're you're a writer you're a director you're a producer like, where did your 
like where did the influence start for you how did you get into movies or what was it a movie or director that you watched at a young age how did how did you get into all this uh, I, I think it you know I think it'll, it's a lot of those things there's a lot of those elements that you mentioned you know you know um, you know uh, inspired by filmmakers mm -hmm. and stuff like that I think a lot of it has to do with you know um, I think the biggest thing of me being being a filmmaker uh, is that I came from a very large family. Um, I had like nine people living in the house. Um, you know, I had six, uh, three boys, three girls. I was the youngest one, brothers and sisters, and um, and um, and my cousins lived with me, and I was the youngest one. My mom and dad and my aunt. We all lived in this one little small house and everything like that. And also being from New York City is definitely just, you know, even growing up during the 80s is such a, you know, surreal uh, um, time how it is now. I mean, it, it is completely opposite what from the 80s to right now, New York City. Um, it's sadly that it looks like it's slowly with this whole lockdown and starting to slowly come back to not not entirely. I mean, you know, let's see what happens when this COVID is over. But it's, you know, the, the crime has gone skyrocket here in New York uh, during the um, this you know, pandemic. But but having that uh, having that large family growing up, uh, there was the weekends would come, and where do you take all these brats? You know, you got all these brats. Where do you take them to to calm them down? Take them to the movie theater. Yeah. So <laughs> what we did was like. Every weekend we went to the movie theater and, and that was, and you know, at that time it was a cheap ticket. Now it's like, you know, taking a, taking a family of just four, it's going to arm and leg here in New, in New York. I mean, all States here is different, but New York city is the highest ticket here. I mean, going there with a, a, a couple and, or, or just two kids four, you're spending on more like 150, $200. That's ridiculous. You know? Uh, um, and, and so, but yeah, so going to the movies and seeing all these movies every weekend was such a big inspiration. And uh, it was so funny because when we used to watch a lot of these Kung Fu movies and these, you know, science fiction movies, and we would come home, um, and my, my brother, my cousin, we would, um, reenact the film that we just saw. <laughs> And, right. and it was it was just so cool. So if it was like a kung fu movie, we, we'll, we'll reenact it, and then we'll make like these stupid little sets with like the couch, and this is the bar, and this is you're gonna come through this door. And I was the youngest one, and it was just so funny that um, they never let me be an actor. Uh, yeah. they were like, oh, you're, not, you're too small, you can't be an actor. So they said, you know what, you'll be the camera guy. <laughs> You can basically tell us and you'll just videotape and tell us where we should go and everything. And it was just so funny. And it was just how things worked out. And I would do it. You know, I was like, okay, these, these guys don't want me to, you know, play, you know, uh, Dark Vader, Luke Skywalker or whatever. You know, maybe sometimes they let me be Yoda because, you know, I was, you know, so I was like, okay. <laughs> so as I was getting older and older and older, you know, time, I started really picking up on like, you know, having a camera um, you know, we had the, the old school camera and then I was able, I was in, I got a, um, uh, an old school high eight camera when I was like, well, I don't know, 14, 15. And I started making a lot of films. They were my friends and we would do all these kind of like, you know, projects. And eventually I said, you know, this is what I want to do. This is, you know, how, um, I, you know, I want to just be a filmmaker. I want to make films yeah. and, and learn the craft. So I, I, I think a lot of it comes down to that. And, you know, watching all those movies and in and, and a very young age, um, you know, and, you know, during that time, it's funny because, you know, I was like maybe like six years old and my, my well, five years old, my parents would take me to watch Friday the 13th, you know, oh, yeah. all the episodes. And, and it's like at that time, like a five or six year old should not watch those films, you yeah. know, so that was just, you know, but it was cool, you know, that time was a little bit different times, you know, you know. You know, going to Times Square, some watching these, some of these movies I'm not even supposed to watch, and so you know, it was a pretty interesting time, and and you know, just the character I think of what who you know what New York is, you know, growing up with a very diverse place and area, and thousands of people you would see and experiences, and you know, it's just I think that that also played a little bit part of it, and um, and yeah, just that's uh, uh that that would I would say like one of the biggest inspirations, you know, like I you know I think we all could relate, but. Every time I watch a movie from like 80s and 90s, or um, I could always look at the film and I know I can remember exactly where I watched the movie, where I was at, where I was sitting. It was just amazing how that, you know, how 
that movie theater experience is not the same as it used to be, you know? Uh, I'm not saying it's good or bad now, you know, because we're living during a time of Netflix time and streaming services, but I think, you know, taking the experience away, you know, I've heard a story not too long ago of people saying that, you know, during the COVID, that the streaming services are starting to think that this might be the permanent thing to do. Like, it's it's a good thing, maybe the taking the movie theaters out and having streaming service, you know, and I'm like, no, I mean, that's, that's one of the, you know, the best things yeah. to do, you know, to take your, your loved one, your, your, your kids. And, you know, because I remember it, I remember being with the family, that was an experience. And you just remember the, who you was with, with your cousins, your brothers. And I think taking that away is just, it's awful to do that because you lose that experience. Yeah. And then going to the theater, the cinema is a great experience. Like I, I remember younger, I seen the Eric Bana Hulk film with, with my father. I remember it very well. Our, our signs even I went to go see signs I was only a kid I shouldn't have been in there it's yeah. just like yourself but but even uh, when I went to see Blade Runner 2049 the theater was empty it was just me in it but that was an experience I'll never forget that yeah yeah but yeah it's pretty cool did you get did you, did you get to uh, study film at all did you go to college or uh, absolutely or yeah stuff like that so I'll take you on to now so when now when I'm like 18 19 I'm saying to myself you know what you know what how can I take this you know to the next level so here, I'm not sure if you know, in New York, they have a school, a trade school it's called like uh, NYFA, New York Film Academy. Yeah, so I, yeah. I took about uh, uh, five, I think five months. It took the in the regular intense. And then I took the, um, yeah, the intense course, the beginners course. And then I was like, oh, you know, I need to learn more about this filmmaking craft. And I took an unusual uh, take on it. Um, I felt like, you know, I was like, okay, um, I did a such a, uh, I did a very successful short film. Um, I was like, okay, so I'm pretty good, you know, thinking I'm so cool. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to take them, you know, so I decided to go and learn street photography and I uh, attended a school in Queens, um, uh, Queensboro, where I, it was amazing. I met my mentor there, uh, Jules Allen, which is one of the most amazing photographers there. And there I was spent like almost like four years learning um, traditional black and white photography and development and everything. And I thought that that was a really big thing because it, I learned more about lighting and storytelling through the still, through the photograph. Um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I, it was an amazing, it was an amazing experience. I, I, I was, but it was like an unusual thing because yes, I did to go film and then now I went to, to, to photography. Um, and I learned all this stuff. I, I still was doing short yeah. films there when I was young. And then I decided, hey, you know what? Let me go back into filmmaking. Uh, my professor um, suggested, I thought he was really smart too. Uh, um, he kind of saw the, the writing on the wall of saying, hey, you know, uh, photography is not going to be the same. You know, we're talking about right now, uh, oof, maybe 90, 95, 96, he told me this, or 97, saying that photography yeah. is changing. I, I think you should go back to filmmaking, uh, go, go back to that. And, you know, you could always do photography, but there's something about him. He saw the writing on the wall. And at that time, digital cameras wasn't as big, you know, at that time, a camera, you know, the, the Canon XL 100, which just came out, which was one of the biggest things like, Oh, wow. And then, you know, everyone was like, Oh, that's digital would never take filmmaking away, but you know, did. and so I went back, I took courses in New York Film Academy, I mean, NYU, uh, New York University, and I started learning more cin uh, cinephotography, um, you know, writing and, and you know, um, all the courses they, 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 you know, were giving. But I felt like I was going, uh, it was just an amazing how New York Film Academy, I'm not saying now, I'm thinking about when, when I was studying it, um, basically taught me everything. It was such an intense yeah. course where basically, here's your camera, you figure it out. And then Tuesdays and Thursdays, we're going to do six hours of what you did, what mistakes you did. And we're going to play with the camera. We're going to show you how to wind the camera, how to put the 16, 35 millimeter inside. Talk to you about the light meter. And then Mondays and Wednesdays, we're going to learn about writing, script writing. It was so intense. I mean, it was, a, it was literally eight in the morning to six o'clock, you know, Monday through Saturday, you know, it was a crazy. So I went there, I'm here in the classes and I'm like, you know, I'm not sure if, uh, you know, if there's anything that I'm learning new and I'm, uh, you know, so I, I did, I eventually wanted to learn more about sort of like animation and I wanted to learn about, 
uh, here's another unusual thing I did. I went to fashion photography and I applied to fashion oh, yeah. technology. So I, I applied myself to all these things that I felt that would help me with these elements of learning um, the craft of filmmaking and photography, um, learning about street photography and learning about fashion photography and how those two were, you have to light your subject matters much differently with black and white, you know, sort of like uh, capturing the moment where in fashion photography is making the moment, you know? So it, it, was, it, was, it was interesting how I put those two together, learn about the craft and everything and apply it into my filmmaking. Cause eventually after the, learning the fashion photography, as my professor said, the writing on the wall was photography was, was coming to end where, you know, now everyone's sort of kind of like photography, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, there is that whole, you know, you know, but again, you know, like example, like, you know, real estate uh, company used to hire professional photographers to take now the photographers are doing, the real estate agents are doing it themselves. That business went away. A lot of business went away from photographers. And, you know, they still have a huge campaign still. So I, you know, I fully went into um, filmmaking after like just learning all those things. And don't get me wrong, I still love uh, photography. I do as much as I possibly can. Um, but I, I, that's my sort of like, um, sort of schooling and learning of me, of, uh, of the stuff that I've learned in the past that helps me now, um, create my projects. Yeah. And it's interesting because many filmmakers or writers will say, oh, just get out there and shoot, just start, get, just get a camera, go out and shoot. You don't have to go to school, but it's interesting that you had that intense experience. Do you think if you never went to school, would you have had the same outlook or same kind of process as you have now while making films or short movies or documentaries? Are you proud that you went to school and learned all the things you did, or maybe you could have started earlier to shoot movies? You know, that's such a great question. Never had anybody ask me that question. Wow. I mean, uh, wolf. I, no, I think the schooling was really important. Um, yeah. You know, there's people, that, everyone is sort of different, right? So, some people just yeah. could, could capture something so quickly. They, they, they could grasp something, they could take it, they could run with it so quickly, or they could go on uh, YouTube and learn it um, so quickly and everything like that. Uh, I think a lot of it, you know, filmmaking has evolved so much. So let's go back when I was learning. Like when I was learning filmmaking, there was no way you could learn a light meter you know, just like, you know, we didn't have YouTube back then, but just learning about yeah. light meeting and how light enters into the light meter and, you know, how it measures it and tells you what, you know, what F-stop you need and what ASA it is and what film stock for it to, you know, for it to use. So that was very important. And taking that, I'm saying, learning that tool of measuring light, you know, during film, you know, with the light meter, I think was very important. Um, and I think that um, learning that helped a lot. Um, and I'm not, I'm not going to knock people to decide to just, you know, you know, pick up the camera and shoot. But um, if you do go and learn, you know, it definitely would be more easier, you know, um, um, as in filmmaking, because th there are a lot of mistakes you make. And I think you still make mistakes regardless what. But, um, you know, to each is their own. I'm not going to knock anyone that does a sort of crash course on their own. But uh, I do really think that the schooling did help. Was there anything yeah. that um, schooling just absolutely did not prepare you for in, in any way? Yeah, I, I think the school does not, and I think that goes for a lot of stuff business-wise. Um, it doesn't prepare you to know like, okay, you know, you, you create your project, you have your project and, you know, what do you do with it next, mm -hmm. you know? Um, again, time is, you know, time, things is changing so much now where like in three years, you know, we weren't able to, you know, sort of like hold our own destiny of our own projects and where we don't have no, you know, we didn't need no aggregators to get our stuff into distribution companies. Now you could just go in and be your own aggregator. Not every place, but a lot of places you can. And I think a lot of filmmaking does not, um, schooling does not teach you that. It doesn't teach you that. And um, you know, um, as years went by, I, th I think um, I think the one of the most important things of filmmaking, being a director, just being like you know director, writer, producer, filmmaker, whatever it is, uh, I think um, it's all about um, um, relationships, mm -hmm. uh, creating relationships, and 
understanding people and, and knowing how to talk to people to come on to projects. And, you know, as a director, that's what you have to do. And I think that's one important thing about filmmaking that they don't really teach you about, you know, just creating the relationships with people and holding those relationships because that's what helps you at the very end to make a film. Would you have any uh, advice on how to uh, sustain those relationships with people who are kind of maybe starting to get into the field and wanting to um, networking might be a bit of a challenge for them? Um, is, is there any specific advice you can give to people who are kind of who are in your shoes? Can I yeah, I, I, I think I would. I, I would give the 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 advice that that you know um i think a lot of uh, when you come in into a project so if, like if you're uh um you're a filmmaker you have this story you you wrote it you want to direct it you also want to produce it you know you know as indie filmmakers and, or indie artists in general that's how we have to be now especially now what's going on you gotta be like a one-man team but you need help yeah. definitely need help and i i think the most important thing is to choose a project that you really um have passionate about and with that passion that you have towards a project people feel it and 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 the people that you bring on board they feel it they know it they look at you and they say oh this guy he believes in his project so much that i'm going to believe in his project so much mm -hmm. and they that is a start of sort of a, a, of a relationship of being created where people take you serious and say to you, say to them that, you know what, I'm going to work with this guy because he had a vision. He brought people to this project and we created his vision and we can see the vision. It may be not be good. Maybe it is good, but that starts to create a relationship when people start taking you serious and then you just stick around, you know, you, you have those people in your pocket and you just never, you know, don't burn bridges. You know, you never know, you know, this project's at five years down the road. Like, you know, I, I projects that I work now, I'm like, Hey, you know what? I worked out with this guy five years ago. I'm like, let me give him a call yeah. and call him. And they know me. And they're like, Oh yeah. I remember we did that project together. So I think that's, that's the start. And the start is basically feel passionate about what you're doing and, and creating uh, um, some of this, pro you know, a project that you feel really passionate about and start to create those projects um, what people start to believe in you. Yeah, it's, I've, I've noticed as well, looking at a lot of your films, you have kind of the same enough cast as well. A lot of people come back to work with you again, yeah. especially with Zombie with a Shotgun. It, 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 that way you're talking about those kind of relationships where there's people that you've worked with will come back to work with you again because you create a good environment to work in. Yeah, yeah, especially with my my main actor um, who who is in Zombie with a Shotgun. We... It was interesting how we actually met. You know, I, I put a casting for a film project that I um, that I that I did. Um, I don't know. Um, we're talking about maybe ten years ago, and uh, I liked his look. I, I, I felt that he would be good for the project. It just didn't work out. And we met, and I told him, "Hey, I got this project. I think you're really cool and everything." And we had like, you know, we actually had lunch. We spoke, and we had such a good time. And um, it didn't work out, um, um, scheduling purposes, reasons why. So I still had his information. So when I was doing, um, when I started to do the episode one of Zombie with a Shotgun, I remembered him. And I was like, oh, you know, uh, let me call Braden. I remember he, he was such a, he had such a good um, vibe about him. I felt, you know, he was such a, you know, cool, chill out guy. And I called him and we we did the five episodes and, um, you know, we started that relationship. We got really well, you know, got to know each other. And as the project started, the, the, the series and the name started getting more popular. Um, I told him, Hey, look, man, if, you know, we're going to do a feature and I, you know, I would love for you to be come on board again. And, uh, you know, he agreed and, you know, we did it together. Yeah. So like, I, let's get to the origin of zombie with a shotgun because the title captures you straight away. And that's what yeah. it did for me, but, it, like I'm a big zombie genre fan. That's why it kind of it spoke to me in a way. I love the Walking Dead series. Big fan mm -hmm. of it. Never watched an episode. Um, Dawn of the Dead, the the old one, and then the remake with Zack Snyder. So did you like what made you do a zombie movie? Did you have influences or a movie or a show that made you want to do this? Or where did the idea come from? So I I did you know when I first started I did a lot of narrative fiction films and stuff like that. And uh, with the time that I came into uh, um, filmmaking when at the time that I start like learning filmmaking 
was a time during like the Brothers McMullen, the Pulp Fictions of the world, you know, Two Days in the Valley. Yeah. That um, um, genre, whatever you want to call it, was, you know, the, the whole dialogue driven di um, genre where, where Quentin Tarantino and all these other guys came on and, and did these sort of like projects. Kind of like, you know, at that time, horror wasn't really popular. But I loved horror and I always wanted to do horror, but I was the guy that was in the, you know, in the crew and the team like, oh, I don't know if I want to do horror because these guys are like horror, you know. So we, 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 you know, at that time, that was the most popular thing. And, and I did a lot of things that, you know, you know, was for that time. Um, and I always wanted to do horror, but I never, it was just interesting that I, I, you know, the genre that I really love, I never did it. I, it took me so many years to finally go, you know, to go into horror. So then I went to documentaries because um, documentaries started, yeah. you know, it started getting popular. And then the documentaries was, um, it was also, it wasn't that expensive. Uh, and that digital video was also there. So I started doing the documentaries and, you know, I had a lot of fun doing the documentaries, but it's something that really kind of like, um, kind of uh, documentary kind of turned me off where um, the reward wasn't as fulfilling as creating a narrative fiction, you know, and that's, that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. um, I think also the reward, yeah. also a bigger reward also. And then during that time, you know, th there wasn't too many outlet outlets. And that's when I finally said, like, you know, hey, hey, let me get into horror. Um, and I, I, I created two web series. I did one with 666 and I did one that was Zombie yeah. with Shotgun. And I wanted to see which one would take off. Um, and as a, as a person that loves horror, I think a lot of filmmakers that love horror, they all wanted, I wanted to do my own interpretation of the zombie genre. And I'll be I'll be really honest with you. I never thought that Zombie Shotgun would take off. Um, it was more of like let's do a web series, and let's see where it takes us. You know, I wasn't sure yeah. where it would take me. Just like everybody who does an artist, do a song, do a short. That you just you know you take it to festival. Let's see how far it gets you. So I was like, all right, I did these two series, and I want again. I wanted to do my own interpretation, and I wanted to do sort of like a POV, you know, point of view of a zombie. A love story romance that was yeah. sort of different you know and um hey you know i took the chance like you know being an artist I said let's let's do this and um the film um um uh, um in one week went viral and it was like yeah. the very first time that i experienced viral so let's go back to the whole title thing you know so the whole title you know we had, there were so many zombie you know, uh, titles that I was thinking about how to do it. And obviously, you know, everyone heard about the hobo with a shotgun and all that stuff. And it's like, hey, look, you know, uh, there's no zombie with a shotgun. And yeah. the title was absolutely a way to lure people into the project. You know, it was a quirky, it was cool, it was funny, it was a campy title. It had all those things in that title when you hear it. Everyone hears it, they have their own sort of, oh, they laugh or they, oh, that's cool. And it worked. So that was it. We yeah. stuck with the title, say, hey, we got to have a shotgun in the film, right? And that's what's going to happen. So um, again, we, we put it out, it went viral. I had all these interviews, these articles, and everything. Uh, and a lot of the origins comes back again. Let's go back to what I was telling you in the 80s. You know, in the 80s, I grew up through whole the AIDS epidemic and stuff like that here in New York City. It was considered ground zero right here in New York City. St. Vincent's Hospital was probably was the hospital that happened here. And I figured that the story would be, you know, sort of similar where, um, you know, people that, are, that, that, you know, we watch zombie movies and everything. We never care about the zombies. We always just kill them and never know who, yeah. what they're about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're just sick. You know, they need help. They need, yeah. you know, so I wanted to incorporate that a little bit. Um, I, I put it in, uh, you know, to say, Hey, look, man, this guy, you know, he, he was a good looking zombie too, which kind of helped that. <laughs> so it helped a lot. And, and so when it, when, when we released it, it was so shocking that, it went crazy. I mean, uh, uh, when we said a web series, there was a lot of, there was even like companies and networks contacted me thinking that this was like a full project, that this was just a trailer. They wanted to buy it, whatever was happening. But no, it was just a, you know, five minute short film and we didn't even do the rest of the episodes. So going back to what I was telling you that I didn't, you know, I didn't, um, I never uh, uh, had the feeling that zombie would get that popular. 
And, you know, again, you know, as an artist, that's what we do, right? We go out there independently and we put out these projects to see if we could catch a wave. Um, and it's hard to catch a wave. You know, we all know it's hard to catch a wave. And I caught a wave. My responsibility was as a filmmaker, as an artist, is this ever going to happen again? I don't know, you know, um, but yeah. I'm going to ride it and I'm going to go with it. So I, I went with it. I said, look, you know, who knows if I could ever do another project like this or if any sort of popularity where I get thousands and thousands of people contacting me, watching it and everything. So we continued it and continued the episodes and then, you know, from there, obviously, you know what happened, but uh, that that that's to take you to story of, of sort of like the origins. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Uh, Lewis, do you have any uh, questions relating to that scenario? Um, well, I this was something that this is kind of I'm going to kind of uh, do a little bit of a detour here. Um, we our last guest um, was uh, Fabian Wagner, who's a cinematographer, and one of the things I want, really was really happy to get his opinion on was how he sees the industry moving forward um, given COVID and whatnot um, and the changes that brings. Um, so when we, when we have an opportunity to interview someone like yourself, it's a good uh, opportunity to get a better insight into behind the scenes. Cause I think one of the things I, I mentioned to Fabian is obviously the uh, most noticeable impact is this kind of accelerated move to streaming services, but like to the general audience, that's basically it. That's all we kind of see COVID doing to the industry. So are there any kind of like hidden effects that you think that maybe the uh, uh, people don't necessarily know about that COVID is going to change um, within the industry? I mean, as in like, uh, um, well, we, as we see the, the, the industry is definitely changed into streaming services, you know, same thing. And I think, uh, I think here in America, I think we're going to suffer the most um, mm -hmm. as you can see, like here, I don't know how you could see it there in um in uh, where you're at in UK, but here in the United States, when you go to the streaming services like Hulu and Netflix and um, whatever, uh, Amazon Prime, you're starting to see that a lot of the projects are from other countries. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it has to do to the whole COVID um, regulations. A lot of countries don't have, and I'm gonna say it, the stupid regulations that we have in this country. So it's a little bit, saying it's happening it's and that's why it's killing the industry so there is a pretty sad thing that's happening here that filmmakers is taking a huge back seat and you know because the regulations is killing what's what's happening to here that they're saying hey you know what well, we can shoot in canada we can shoot in you know in uk you know we can shoot anywhere you know we can shoot anywhere around out of this country because the regulations is not the same it's not killing you know here it's killing it you know, I, I think a lot of people know that, you know, they see the streaming services, you know, they watch it, they see it. Um, but it is, it, it, it's sad too, because that is the only way that, you know, we can be exposed and seen um, and make some kind of money, you know. Uh, um, uh, and, you know, you know how it is being an independent artist. artist. It's hard, you know, it's very difficult. I mean, you know, um, you know, even like how, how zombies, I can't even believe how far we got with zombie with five episodes and from a comic, from, you know, feature and then from the game. And it's just sort of crazy, you know, it was, it, all that was done independently. And, you know, a lot of people don't see that, you know, and, and it's very difficult to do. And, um, and people get lost in that whole streaming services. And I hope I'm understanding the question you're saying, but yeah, yeah, a lot of people, totally, yeah. A, a lot of people get lost in the streaming services and they see films like mine, independent films. And they're like, Oh, you know, you know, it's not, it's not a big budget. It's not anything like that, you know? And, you know, people just don't understand the, the hard work that goes with it. You know, you, you use the resources that you only could have to make your project the best that you possibly can. Mm -hmm. I, and, um, you know, and, and now you got the big dogs coming in and saying, Hey, look, you know, there's no movie theaters, not making money. Like we're going to put out all these big, multi-million dollar budgets we have there and it kicks the small guys like you know me and, and independence and back more back uh, and it affects us you know because we're not you know you know now when you go in the streaming services you got you have like this whole new category that you know pushes all the independence you know streaming service movie theaters all access uh 
uh, what's new in the theaters, what's new in the, you know, uh, uh, you know, then you got the little bigger budget, uh, the bigger independent budget projects. So, you know, that, that, that there is effect with the uh, streaming services. I mean, you know, you got, you know, you, you know, um, got to hustle. I feel bad that, you know, for a lot of independent pro um, filmmakers that are, are starting out now, um, it's, it's pretty hard now, you know, mm -hmm. you know look, look how many um, executives they laid off and how many um, agents, you know, they, 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 you know, every single major um, agent here in the United States, you know, um, they, they laid off possibly like 60 to 70% of their staff. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty scary, you know? So it's, 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 uh, you know, it's a challenge and, uh, and you know, I, I guess you try to look at it on the bright side, like, well, you know, this sort of like a silver lining to it, like basically say, okay, you know, it gets the independent artists more out there more like, uh, inspired to go out there and say, Hey, look, let's, let's, let's create art, you know, and, um, whatever we can do. Um, um and, you know, it's, it's, uh, we'll take it one day at a time. Do you think now with streaming services, do you think it offers more of a chance for independent stuff in terms of like in a theater, there'll be a big movie coming out every single week or maybe every two weeks or three weeks, a big movie will come. But on streaming services, you kind of need to have the audience's attention nearly every single day. Do you think if you start making more stuff independently, do you think it'll get picked up by these streaming services or is are, are you... Are you confident that the big boys are just there to play right now? The, the big studios, the big stars are just going to be on the streaming services and your stuff will not be kind of wanted as much? Um, I think a little bit in both. Um, the only, the, the cool thing yeah. about, um, the cool thing about horror, there, there's, you know, there's amazing fans. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say they're probably the yeah. best ones and the loyal fans. Um, and I think that, you know, horror, there's people like, you know, such as myself, you know, I see a horror film on a streaming service I've never seen before. Ooh, I'm gonna watch that, you know? And and, mm -hmm. and you watch it and you never know, film one of those films could catch fire and it becomes, you know, sort of like a cult classic and stuff like that. Um, and I think that's the thing about horror, you know, that, that you know, a lot of the fans um, out there, you know, the conventions is what makes it really, you know, survive that horror genre, which is really cool. I think, uh, um, I think, you know, how everything is, you know, money's always put into the bigger project, you know, the promotion money is always going to go there. Independent people like us, you know, like me, my social media is my only promotion kind of platform I'm out there promoting stuff. And I think that, um, um, I think, yeah, I, I think it's just like anything else, right? It's like we, we um, you know, you, you, you put out like um, Hollywood puts out like, I don't know, like maybe 300 or 200 films a year or whatever. You probably see two or three of them that, really become like sort of like oh wow this is come out of nowhere this 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 uh project has become big and i think the same thing with independent you have like a, you know a couple hundred projects come a year and there's like two or three that just out of nowhere just like a big hit and mm. so i think there's oh i i, I mean absolutely absolutely also and here's another thing also i think we brought it up a little bit before because you don't need right now you don't really need to aggregate it before you need an aggregator to get your film out there now you could actually put your stuff out online. You know, you could put it up on, you know, Amazon. You could put it up on YouTube. There's other, like, other streaming services. You could put up Vimeo's one place. And you could promote it and yeah. make your own money. You, make, you, you definitely could make money. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's still difficult because you're the only promotion machine, you know, so how many followers you have or how many people is going to, how you're going to catch that wave, you know, how you're going to market that project. And, but... Yeah, I mean, again, it's just it's just a lot of hard work, a lot of hard grinding, and um, um, you can, you know, you just got to be in, in um, a little bit different out there and how you market your stuff, and you know, so I, I think yes and no. Hmm. On a on a bit more of a, a, a an optimistic note, uh, I wanted to ask if you had the complete freedom to make like absolutely anything that you could, series, uh, film, whatever what would you do what genre would you go for um do you think uh right now as i speak right now right now any kind of any of my own projects of course it's uh, <laughs> a hard <laughs> one um hmm. you know uh i i feel um you know and i don't feel i know uh, that when we finished zombie with a shotgun we didn't have enough money to obviously finish the project uh 
there was a cliffhanger there at the end. Um, and I definitely love to go back and do a sequel, you know, for the fans to finish it off the way we really wanted to finish it off. And this time a full-time zombie going crazy, right? Going, whatever he goes berserk or whatever, anything. Uh, and I, I think it would be pretty cool if I would go out there and just uh, do the sequel for the fans and just do something where I have, you know, so much more freedom with budget wise and everything like that. And I think right now that that comes right on top of my head. Um, um, yeah, I would do, I, I would definitely love um, to go out and do a sequel for it in a, in a very kick ass budget. That's a very yeah, good there's, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, but it seems to be that there's a loyal fan base there online from what I see. Yeah, that's followed, that's followed this movie, followed the series. But I want to talk about, um, I'll get to the movie in, in a whole in a minute, but I want to talk about the comic book as well. Did the comic book come before the movie or did it come after the movie? It came before the movie, after the episodes. So okay. if you want me to give you a little bit of uh, rundown on it, we, we did. Yeah, I'm just interested. Yeah, I'm just interested how that idea came to do a comic book then uh, outside of all this. Pretty cool. Yeah. So we, we so what happened is, um, um, you know, again, s- social media is so amazing. You know, uh, you meet people, make unbelievable people. You make your contacts there. You can make you know, a lot of things can happen. Social media, we use it wisely. Um, so when we did the episodes, um, the, the number one question was, what, um, when are you guys going to do a feature film? Um, um, yeah, you know, I was like, oh, wow. You know, that you know, people, like you said, the fan base was growing and growing. I said, like, all right, we got to do a feature. And, you know, I, I felt that, you know, you know, I had a lot of things going for me, you know, the web series, you know, it was a small little web series, but it still had, you know, it, 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 it still had, you know, something there to, you know, go on a feature. Um, the episodes are really short, uh, but I still felt that, you know, that it was very popular enough that, hey, you know what, I can go out there and talk to producers and investors and show them this and say, hey, look, you know, and, and, and it doesn't happen that easy. Yes, I did meet a lot of producers in the industry. They heard about it. They knew about it. But nobody wanted to be like that first penguin to jump in the water, right? It was like it, it was always how much money you got, you know, and whatever you got, we could bring. Um, I didn't have nothing, you know. So I, I you know, it was, it was very difficult. So one of the things that I felt like is like, you know what? I should start creating some artwork to promote this project more, like new posters and stuff like that. And um, uh, amazing artist, uh, Simone, Simone Gulamini, an uh, Italian artist from Italy. You know, um, I was following him, we were talking and he's like, oh, I love his song with a shotgun. And we, uh, we used to, I used to always say to him, hey, I want you to do my comic one day. And he's like, oh, I would love to. We was always like playing around, teasing around. So, you know, I, I went to him. I said, hey, look, I need to, you could do this posters, cover art for me. And he was like, sure. So when he started creating them, they, became, they were so amazing. That when we promoted it, what do you think people said? Oh, is this your new comic book? <laughs> oh no, it's not. It's not a. You give know, us more. <laughs> yeah, give us more. So Simone and I, we we talked and said, hey, look, a lot of fans are starting to say that they want to see a comic book. So we got, you know, we talked and you know, eventually, you know, we got the idea and everything, and we started, you know, collaborating and we. We did an amazing sort of like uh, promotion. We promoted ourselves and said, you know, every single day you would sketch something, I'll promote it. And every single day somebody would get a new sketch with a black and white panel penciled and everything. And let's see if we could grow the audience more like that and interest. And it did, it was incredible. So every day we would have a new sketch. And then after five days, you would see a pencil panel and it got popular. Uh, uh, Simone is a really amazing artist. Um, he was responsible for Near Death. He drew the Image Comics. He drew the whole episodes for um, Near Death for Image Comics. And uh, um, that was his, you know, one of his crazy, um, his amazing uh, um, comic book series he did. And he still works with them. He's working with Titan Comics now. He's doing some amazing stuff, but he gets really busy. So I was so blessed that he yeah, was his art style really stands out. Like the characters really stand out on the page. That's what I saw when I was looking at it. Yes. Yes. So what, so what happened is he got really busy and we needed to, um, 
we wanted to continue up series. So he had took one of his um, artists that he worked with, which is called uh, Ian Miller, came on board and he drew the next episodes with help with uh, Simona drawing, collaborating with covers and stuff like that. So eventually we came with five, five issues um, and, and Simona was the first issue uh, thing and I don't know if that confused people, but people was always say, what happened to uh, Gugamini? He came, you know, the, the, the other episodes or anything, but um, um, yeah, he was responsible for the first issue. And then we have Ian and, and we had, like I said, five issues. We, you know, we, we kept on going. We wanted to see how long we got. And I mean, we got, I mean, for five issues, we got pretty far. And then when I would say about the second or third issue, we um, got the budget for Zombie with a Shotgun. And the fourth and fifth issue um, filed afterwards, simultaneously when we were working on the feature. Hmm. And um, that was that. Uh, it's pretty cool that you were able to go from a series to the shorts and then a comic book and then eventually a movie. So what was that like? So is it one co coherent, coherent story? Like, do you need to watch the series, then read the comic to understand no. the film? Or are these individual stories? See, then that, that was also a really, um, um, it, it's pretty cool in, in the sense that nothing is really connected. <laughs> so people say, oh, yeah. do you, you know, do you have to read the, is the comic book like the movie? Is the movie like the comic? Because people come with the same question you ask. Um, did, the, did the comic come before the movie? Uh, or did the movie come before the comic? And everything like that. Obviously, we, when we did the comic, you know, you know, in the very beginning and everything, we have military soldiers shooting and everything. This is a very upscale, high scale uh, budget that would be. So it, it would be amazing if we did follow the comic book, um, but we couldn't, you know. So, you know, we, we, you know, we, we have to dictate what we, the, the resources we had, the money, basically. So um, when we got the budget, of course, we were like, oh, you know, um, Obviously, we can't follow the comic. So we had to change. There's few elements that you would get in the comic that is in the film. So we we had to, of course, reduce it down and you know do a you know very low scale featured film and change up the story to work for us. And so um, the film, the comic, is totally different. Um, you know, again, there's some things there, but it's totally different. And the web series uh, can be sort of followed into the film, but doesn't have to. You can watch each yeah. one on its own and get a whole understanding about it or your own inter interpretation about it. And sort of kind of like parallels with each other. Like, oh, okay, I see what he's doing here and there. But, um, you know, I always say, if you, if you watch the first episode of, of the web series, yeah. you get, you know, what you see is what you get is basically sort of like, you're getting in that sort of uh, quality into the film. Yeah. Lewis, any thoughts? Um, well, on the uh, web series front, um, I have to say, well, actually, just generally speaking, uh, not just web series, but the, the, one of the things that I always go to look for when I'm watching anything zombie related is the makeup and the zombie design. Um, and I, you know, obviously really like the uh, the design that you had going forward. What is that as a as a as a creative process when you're kind of visualizing your zombie design? Are you, are you just like straight up when you're starting the project? You're like, I know exactly how I want it to look, or is it a very detailed kind of collaborative, lengthy process to get to the final design? Mm, I like that question. Yeah, I, I that's a I never got somebody ask that question. It's pretty cool. So yeah, that that that. So when you see the the how the the zombie look had evolved from the web series, obviously we were going for like something really simple, something not you know, and again, to get kick ass makeup you need money, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we, you know, the web series was like ah oh, it was generic sort of makeup. It wasn't the you know I guess you know it wasn't like a Walking Dead sort of makeup you know, uh, Greg uh, Greg Ontario uh, makeup from Walking Dead. Yeah. Yeah. So when we did the feature, we we shot the project and everything like that, and we <laughs> we ran out of money, so we couldn't really do the main zombie with the shotgun. So um, we had to raise money for that, and 
I wanted to basically, I, that, that's what was, I had to have a kick as zombie. Yeah. So I got an art, a local artist here in New York City, um, uh, Ben, who worked on all the, you know, uh, works in a lot of big Gotham. He does a lot of the, the makeup for a lot of the big guys. And then you know, from like Penguin, Joker, he does a lot of the ma- makeup there. Oh, very cool. Amazing uh, special effects artist guy. And we've been talking for a couple of years about the whole thing. Um, and my whole thing was, um, I always make this, uh, I always make this whole, um, um, whatever you want to call it, um, saying about zombies, like, you know, what happened when, um, why did zombies always sort of become this sort of like walking slow, slow man, whatever, slow dead zombie, and there was no intelligence in it. Why did we go there when in 1984, Michael Jackson evolved it so quickly with his dance moves, his moving quickness, and he was one of the most kick-ass zombies. I never could understand that. And then we went back. And, you know, that's considered one of the greatest music videos in history. Um, You know, of course, with John Landis directing it and his vision and his makeup. I just felt like, what happened? Why did we go back? We And no one could really understand that. You know, I, 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 I just felt like that. So one of my biggest inspirations was I wanted to have a zombie that looked like Michael Jackson. So when you look at the when you look at the makeup uh, of zombie with a shotgun, it has that sort of Michael Jackson feel. So when I went to when I went to Ben, this is funny. It's the first time I ever told anybody the collaboration idea behind it. I always felt very strong and powerful about my um what i felt about why did the zombies not evolve after 84 and why did we go back so i always felt really strong about that so i felt like you know what i would love to do some sort of like i don't know what you call it, homage to it or whatever so when i told ben i said you know what i want i want i want that michael jackson makeup look with the new age sort of like um uh, feel of like sort of like a Walking Dead to uh, I gave him another um, Night of the Living Dead sort of feel to it a look so there was like three images that I gave him and I, I just wanted that but the main one was to have like sort of that Michael Jackson wow. makeup look and put it all together so we you know we sat down we checked we went to different um, makeup companies that was able to help us have that look and get the different sort of molding and makeup and kits and stuff like that it was a pretty big process and you know getting all the stuff and him creating it at home and blah 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 so that was the inspiration of the look of zombie with a shotgun awesome uh i think we've got a a couple of messages in the chat somebody a comedy videos asks has the raimi evil dead films been an inspiration on your work yes yes i mean th- that I would, I would, you know, it's so interesting, you know, um, when I watch Evil Dead, I, I, I don't know if you guys feel like this, I just never get zombie kind of, I just feel like right. it just feels like some sort of his own sort of kind of like monster kind of guys and everything. Right. But I can tell you um, that I can still remember where I was at when I watched Evil Dead. <laughs> it, it, it was, uh, yes, I, I, it's so amazing. And um Definitely um, um, one big inspiration, you know, um, um, those, those Evil Dead uh, series was freaking awesome. And, you know, so it's pretty amazing, you know, when you watch those things, uh, one and two, of how much work went into that, right? And we just don't kind of see that anymore. And I think it's because it's, it's, uh, it's funny because back then they apply that sort of like makeup and all that stuff sort of kind of like easily. And now to do that is sort of like so expensive to do. Um, and, um, no, absolutely. Okay. Uh, and yeah, cool boy asks, what are your favorite filmmakers that led an inspiration on your work? Oh, uh, you know, every day could be different. Um, I definitely, you know, uh, I think everyone, a lot of people would, would, would say the same things that I would say, like, you know, Blade Runner is my ultimate favorite film. And I think everybody, I think there's a lot of people would agree with me. And I would say like a, a really Scott is definitely one big, you know, uh, inspiration of films. Um, and, you know, there's so many different, I love David uh, Cronenberg. Um, Dead Zone to me is just an, an amazing film. Um, you know, every day could be different, but those guys, 
you know, like a Michael Mann and, and uh, um, it's just, you know, you, you could go down a list of like so many guys, but I, you know, the one that comes to my head is really Scott because of, of, you know, of, of the whole uh, uh, Blade Runner and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I mean, again, it's just so many different um, um, directors, but I like uh, David Cronenberg is one of my favorites also. Awesome. Yeah, just another question there as well. Uh, does Hilton like the giallo style of zombies? G I A L L O. Italian like slasher movie, slasher movies. Giallo. Yeah, absolutely. Like you're talking about like what zombie and all that stuff, and yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I it's one of my um, to this day one of my favorite uh scenes when he's under the water in the very beginning. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on on one of the um zombie films that um i think it's just called zombie zombie 2 that was he was under the water um that was one of my favorite scenes and no one's ever done before we it's funny that you said that because we we actually wanted to do a under the water scene with zombie with a shotgun we just didn't could not rake the money um and on for the sequel we we definitely want to do that but that was something we try to push so hard to have an underwater scene with zombie with a shotgun um and there's this, it's funny because it, it, it was inspired through one of the scenes in the comic books and uh we definitely gonna and, and, and me talking to the actor braid i said you know we, we do a sequel it, it, we have to have that underwater shot of you under there um but um stay tuned i'm pretty sure we're gonna do it that's pretty cool uh, also the the movie when it came out is it, it's still out now actually it's just uh, amazon you can get it on amazon and you can also um, you can find that on the Twitter page if you just follow the links to that zombie with a shotgun Twitter page. Is that where, is that where the that's where the best way to find the movie right now? Yeah, I know. I, I know. Like if in UK, if you um, in UK, there is the Amazon UK. You have to you have to hit. Yeah. Of course, Amazon UK. There's in UK. It won't play here. Of course, in the United States, just like the American version won't play in UK version. Mm. So a lot of times I get a lot of Twitter messages from UK and they say, oh, that, you know, we don't, I, I can't find Amazon, which I, I don't, I don't know why not. They just did not search it. So I just send them the direct link for the UK version. So yeah, it's on, you know, like in Tubi, it's on, you know, in, in YouTube, it's in um, Amazon. Um, oh, forgot the other site. <laughs> um, uh google google play it's on yeah. yeah so you can you know all those uh other stuff i mean we're supposed to be going to other ones also like you know voodoo we're going to be going on and we're trying to you know get slowly surely more more uh streaming services but you know those are the ones that you know the main ones that you know uh people can get so um yeah, yeah. so not only did you make a, a web series then you made a movie there was a comic book as well. And there's also a, a new game out, Zombie with a Shotgun. Yeah. And I got to play the demo. I got to play the demo. And it's actually pretty fun. It is fun. It is so, fun. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm, uh, I, I feel sometimes blessed and luck. Uh, uh, a lot of the fans that, you know, uh, that I meet are a lot of these creators, a lot of these people that, you know, that come on board and say, hey. And one of the things that people say to me is, hey, you got a game. You know, um, and, yeah. and you know, I, I feel like, you know, um, we, um, again, I feel blessed with doing it. And I just, oh, my God, I can't believe I had a game. So it was pretty amazing when uh, I met these individuals, you know, Frederick, he's from Sweden, actually. The two artists are from Sweden. It's so funny because a lot of the, the people that I work for are in Europe, you know, and I'm, I'm not yeah. even working here in the States. So these two artists in, in, uh, who own a, com a gaming company called Roaring Kittens. Uh, Frederick uh, leads that Helms at Hope, that company, um, was also a comic book artist. And that's how we actually met. Um, he's a, um, a colorist uh, and he does colors for, for, and he's also a comic book artist himself. So he came on board uh, to color some of the, the issues. And again, we played with the whole idea that, you know, I, I think I remember telling him, hey, you know, I read your bio. And I see that you make video games. We got to do a video game one day. It was, again, it was a, it was a joke. I, I think this was about maybe two years ago, maybe a little bit, two years and a half. So, um, you know, we just played with the whole idea and everything. And then we just started talking more and more. And then um, um, I don't know how the conversation came, but I think it, it, it came up with like uh, concepts of how the video game. Oh, yes, I do remember now. So when the movie came out, 
the animation in the film, right? Which is also was done by an amazing artist here who worked on MTV um, Liquid Television. He was responsible for, uh, for um, a stick figure theater on MTV. And that was one of the main reasons why I hired him because one of his favorite episodes at MTV was the Night of the Living Dead stick figure. Um, so I got him to come on board to do Zion with a Shock and stick figures, but he wanted to do it much more elaborate, much, much, you know, it was more sort of a, a, a sinister kind of like, you know, look to it, which is, you know, more kind of like serious, I would say. So when I was talking to Frederick from Sweden, I was telling him, hey, you know, it would be pretty cool. We got a video game with sort of that feel of that pencil kind of like zombie stuff and everything. Um, <clears throat> Then he was like, oh, you know what? I could draw some concepts on it. So he drew some, you know, zombie with shotgun concepts for the video game. And, <clears throat> you know, started getting, you know, more and more, and, um, you know, with graphs. I was like, hey, you know what? We should start a campaign. So we started a campaign and um, campaign did not take off as much as, and even now the campaign is not really even taken off now. And, and a lot of it has to do, I think, to the COVID because I'm getting a lot of people saying, oh, COVID, whatever. But we still game onto it. So what happens when that first campaign, when we went on, um, we're like, okay, let's go back on it in the next few months. So believe it or not, because of COVID, you know, all of us had to be home, a lot of us. So that actually made the game even be get more developed quicker because everybody was home, nobody mm -hmm. was doing anything. So Frederick and Roaring Kittens decide, hey, you know what? I'm home. You know, me and my partner we're going to finish this or we're going to make something almost look finished product. Let's do a demo. Let's get back on it. So again, you know, a lot of this stuff, you know, and I think everyone would believe would, would agree with me. A lot of this stuff is luck. And I think, you know, that was sort of, you know, uh, a play with luck, uh, you know, even though on an unfortunate situation, we was able to get the game out and, you know, we, we, we still working on the campaign. We're going to release it back on another, um, uh, another uh, campaign uh, soon, so you know, keep on working to get the full game because right now it's on PC. And we're trying to get into other outlets, but the demo's out there. You guys could, you know, anyone could download the demo. You could go on Roaring Kittens on their site, um, download the demo, play with it. And it is pretty cool. The whole thing was to get a retro kind of feel to it, and I think they added, uh, you know, their touch to the game, which is pretty awesome. Yeah, you can kind of it's not just walk it's not like walking back and forth you could actually go further into the like say if there's a wall or a door you could be at the at the front of the camera and then you could walk backwards as well and go around things it's, it's pretty cool yeah. i like the way it was done yeah I, yeah it was it, it's pretty amazing and um you know um again i i just uh it's just so uh how far again you know we go back to our beginning of our conversation about i've never in a million years thought that just doing that one episode it's just an idea and that's how it all starts right it starts with an idea and a dream you know and i always tell a lot of like young filmmakers you know you, you know you just do it man you know you, you just believe in it and you, you know it, it can happen you know and it, we go back to it just and it just you know and fast forward to now i just can't even believe how how it took the steps and how it, you know to now a game is just it's pretty awesome you know and, and again you know in the independent for you know away you know we we even even doing the feature film we we didn't, we didn't even spend you know you know really nothing to make the movie you know i mean uh, uh we rate we was able to raise monies but it wasn't that kind of money and um you know uh, i'm so uh, i'm satisfied and happy how you know even looking at the film like damn how did we get away from doing those you know it was very right. ambitious you know I, you know you could go back and say hey you know but i've done this different and different you know uh, yeah, possibly. You know, I should never have thirty actors in, a, in an independent film. <laughs> you, know <what> I mean? <laughs> you know, that was very ambitious. You know, I look back and I said, "Shit!" You know, yeah. we had thirty. I had brought thirty actors in this film. Why did I do that? I think because you know, again, you know, you're so ambitious. And as you know, as, as all artists we are, and I said maybe we should have just had like a six man team. You know, instead of a thirty. <laughs> but it's cool. Uh, I'm happy. Uh, I'm you know, like I said, fortunate that you know, uh, I feel like you know, horror film is sort of the essence of independence where people start and everything like that. And I think we show that way of like how you can get into the horror, how we did it so independently, true independently to the essence of, you know, what horror first started and how, you know, began. And now it's big budget now. Now it's like 
you know, Walking Dead is just huge. It's an amazing, it's an amazing production. And, and that helped out even get more bigger yeah. productions out there in, in the market, in the world. And, um, but again, you know, it's a, um, um, it's, it's a pretty cool. Okay. I just, I just wanted to, I just wanted to say like, cause the, the zombie genre is, is thriving. The Walking Dead has its own show plus spinoffs with movies coming. There's even a Netflix uh, movie coming that Zack Snyder's doing another army, arm, I call Army of the Day. Yeah, so it's kind of, it's, it, it's, it's it, there's a huge fan base out there. And I, I want to thank you very much for coming on to the, onto the podcast today and, and telling us about your experience. And you're a great example of just getting out there and doing it if you're passionate mm-hmm. enough about it. So. absolutely and listen guys thank you for having me on i really appreciate it anytime you know hopefully there were some people to get some insight you know some of the stuff i got there's you know independent filmmaker uh, um actors directors artists that you know want to get out there yeah absolutely just get out there you know just again i always say my my, my best thing my favorite thing i always say just make sure you're passionate about it you believe in it because i mean you do everybody will a lot of the stuff that i've talked about to everybody who's listening to you guys was all about believing in the project. And, and, and for me, believing on this, uh, um, you know, and Zombie with a Shotgun is what made all this happen from the comic to the game, to the web series, to all the artwork, to the feature. It was all because I believed in it so much that people felt that and they thought, oh man, this guy definitely got a vision and he believes in it so much. I'm, I believe in it. I'm going to come on board. I'm going to work on this also because, you know, I believe in it. I'm going to act in this film. I'm going to come and create music for this guy. I'm going to do all that. And that's just one of, you know, the best things to just having that belief in yourself. And trust me, all the pieces will fall in place. All right. Well, thank you for uh, that message. And, uh, and as Sean said, thank you for your time. Um, that's, uh, that's really cool for everyone who is watching. Thank you for stopping by. Be sure to check out zombie with a shotgun available in literally any medium you can possibly imagine i'm sure there'll be a, a dramatic <laughs> novel at some point uh maybe a, <laughs> the soundtrack there's gonna be it's gonna be everywhere we're trying we we, we we there you would be you wouldn't be surprised if so many ideas that people pitch to me and i'm like hey you know what i never thought about that you know <laughs> <laughs> but we put the, i'll put tell the you movie buffs at the end of the book if you do it <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you one thing that we've been talking about more than lately in the past couple of weeks was um, going back on the campaign and creating the sequel. And that is something that we've been um, talking about for 2021. Of course, you know, we all have to wait what's going on. But that is something that uh, myself and uh, one of the original producers who also was in the film, Kyle Hester, uh, we've been discussing the last two weeks, like, hey, look, you know, what are we going to do? Sit around or what are we, you know, so we're just talking. And uh, but that I think um, I'm pretty sure that will be the next thing that we're going to be working for. You know, I mean, look, it, it took Zami with a shotgun three years. I mean, we can wait. We can do another three years for a sequel, too. I mean, you know, it is what it is. You know, we just this is just how it is. You know, uh, Look, we welcome a lot of people. We welcome a lot of investors. We welcome a lot of horror producers just to come on board. If they come on board, they come on board. But you know what? Uh, there is where there's a way, there's a will. And, and, and now independent filmmaking, you can do it. So that's what we're aiming for. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. And uh, thank you, everybody, for watching. And we'll be uh, back. I don't know when. Sometime, sometime next week. And we'd love to have you on again, uh, especially when Zombie with a Shotgun 2 is uh <laughs> is it coming out and three and four all the sequels they're all coming that would be awesome we could do like a, a james cameron shoot three in them in a row yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well thank you for watching everybody